One relationship in our culture that seems fractured is our body politic, and so I want to talk today on this Independence Day about the divided states of America. 77% of Americans believe that our country is greatly divided. Uh, the political right and left used to talk to each other, not so much anymore. Now it seems like we talk past each other. Um, uh, you know, you watch a news show, person on the right, person on the left, they'll interpret the events totally differently. Uh, often they can't even agree on the facts. Sometimes they'll end up shouting at each other. Uh, today, it seems that even disasters divide us. In years past, national tragedies like Sutherland Spring shooting, Parkland, Florida, or the devastation Hurricane Maria caused in Puerto Rico would draw us together. Not so much anymore. Uh, within minutes, social media was full of partisan debate over how to think about the events. Here's an example of how divided we've become. In 1986, Justice Antonin Scalia was confirmed to the Supreme Court by a vote of 97 to 0. Last year, Neil Gorsuch uh, just eked out his confirmation to the Supreme Court by a vote of 52 to 45, almost strictly on a party line vote. Uh, in our divided country, few congressional leaders can afford to cross party lines. Can the divide in our country be bridged? Can our country be healed? Uh, is there hope for the divided states of America again becoming the United States of America? I've come to the conclusion that only with God's help and with his supernatural power to transform hearts and minds do I believe we can again become the United States of America. Let me offer five suggestions that can, with God's help, can help us uh, become the United States of America. You can't do anything about what other people say or, th or do, uh, but you can control what you do. Uh, so my hope today is if, if all of us could apply these five suggestions, we could at least lower the temperature in our relationships and bridge the divide with people we know. Now, one ground rule. Uh, let's all show grace, okay? Uh, I can't possibly get through this message without saying something. Uh, if you uh, tend to be on the right, we'll uh, be disappointed with. Or if you tend to be on the left, you'll disagree with. Uh, so can we agree to, to show grace? Uh, no eye rolls. <laughs> no audibles, like, what a crazy idea that is. All right, fair enough? Here we go. Number one, do all you can to point people to Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. Uh, sometimes I hear people say, if we can just win the presidency and the Senate and the House and, and get a supermajority, then we can make things right. That's a pipe dream. You can pass new laws, but you can't stop hate until you can change hearts. The Apostle Paul writes, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God that transforms hearts. When our nation is filled with hatred and dissension and fighting, I believe only the power of Jesus Christ can transform hate into love. This week in our journal, we read 1 Samuel 2.2, uh, 2, there is no one holy like the Lord, there is no one besides you, there is no rock like our God. There's no one holy like God. He is the standard of right and wrong. And then we read uh, verses 8 to 10, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the hash heap. He seats them with princes, he has them inherit a throne of honor, for the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. God is the one who established the foundations for this world. He knows how this world can work, but we have to turn to him if we want to see him change hearts. We must share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible. I believe the problems facing the United States are ultimately spiritual problems that require spiritual solutions. The church's most powerful word is the gospel. 
The more people who come to know Jesus Christ and his grace, the more likely it is that we can return to civil discourse. And the more likely it is that we can, our experiment in democracy can work. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French uh, statesman, toured America in the 1830s. In his book, Democracy in America, he wrote, Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors, her fertile fields and boundless forests, her rich mines, vast world commerce, her public school system, institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. There's no country in the world where Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And its influence is powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. Now get this, America is great because America is good. And if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. De Tocqueville's point was that the founders of the United States began with an assumption. The assumption that was that Americans would be a moral people. The founding fathers were very religious. 51 of the 55 members of the Constitutional Convention were Christians. Here's some of the backstory of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. John Witherspoon was an ordained minister. Charles Thompson was a biblical scholar. Benjamin Rush is considered the father of American medicine. He also founded the First Day Society, which is a precursor to the Sunday School movement. He said the Constitution was as much the work of divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testaments. Francis Hopkinson was a church music director. Roger Sherman, the only founding father to sign all four of our founding documents, the Articles of Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the U.S. Constitution, was a theologian. John Adams, our second president, served as the first leader of the American Bible Society, which began as an act of Congress. George Washington, our first president, said, it's impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Patrick Henry, the first governor of Virginia, stated, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the Founding Fathers is a proper noun. It refers to the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, the denominational affiliations of these men is a matter of public record. Uh, at a time when church membership entailed a sworn public confession of biblical faith and mainline churches were all Bible-based, not like many are today, among the delegates were 28 Episcopalians, 8 Presbyterians, 7 Congregationalists, two Lutherans, two Dutch Reformed, two Methodists, two Roman Catholics, one unknown, and only three deists. Uh, historical revisionists uh, uh, emphasize only the deists. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. They did not set up the United States as a Christian nation. They purposely made no mention of God in the Constitution. When they did mention God in the Declaration of Independence, they had the wisdom to leave it at that. They didn't say the Jewish God or the Christian God. They wanted people of all religious faiths to be free to worship as they saw fit. They wanted immigrants with different religious backgrounds to be able to come here and thrive. But they believed in God and Jesus Christ and the immutable laws of right and wrong. They assumed that the people of the United States would be a moral people. We can't possibly have a police officer on every corner. But if we can inculcate in most Americans a conscience that, conscience that directs them to choose to do what is right, then we have a police officer on every corner. Then our democracy can work. De Tocqueville believed that when Americans ceased to be a God-fearing, moral people, the American experiment in democracy would no longer work. 
They talk, uh, uh, I think that is partly what we're seeing today. As the place of Christian faith in our culture has decreased and secularism has increased, dissension has escalated. I believe to a great extent we are witnessing a spiritual battle. Uh, how our country has changed over the last 70 years is evidenced by something that took place December 6, 1944. Everybody knew the United States was going to invade France, but nobody knew when. Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation in a radio broadcast. He led the country in prayer. Uh, historian Stephen Ambrose, in his uh, book D-Day, shares the prayer. Why don't you read it with me? Our sons, this is before we're you know, invading uh, Normandy, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. These men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They yearn for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And, O oh Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. Some criticized this prayer, but they were largely ignored. Maybe it was insensitive to atheists, but he wasn't establishing a national religion. My point is that it would be unthinkable for a president today to lead us in prayer. We have shifted our roots that were based in faith in God. I think the greatest hope for the United States today is for healthy churches to pro proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think churches should focus on proclaiming the gospel of Christ and not get involved in political activism. That's why you never hear Chris or Micah or me talk about politics. I don't mean that Jesus will turn this into a Christian nation, but as more people experience God's grace, we may be able to return to civil discourse. Which leads to my second point. Speak the truth in love. The Apostle Paul writes, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Paul gives us counsel on how to speak to others, particularly those with whom we disagree. Speak in love. That's quite the opposite of what we're seeing today. Many of us speak in hate. We talk in disgust. Our social media posts show disdain for people with whom we disagree. At the royal wedding, Bishop Michael Curry told Harry and Meghan and really all of us to love each other. John said, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. The Apostle Paul says, Love never fails. Uh, to speak in love is to speak with respect towards those who hold diff views different from us. It's to be kind. It's to stop seeing the other side as the other side. Polls show that many Americans think that people of the opposite viewpoint are a threat to the nation's well-being and trying to destroy the country. One way to speak in love is to uh, look for uh, points of agreement. For all of our disagreements, most of us cluster somewhere around the middle. Polls show that practically all Americans uh, have things we agree on. We agree on helping uh, veterans, uh, uh, helping the less fortunate, and strengthening small businesses. Uh, in our recent election, the Beaverton uh, school measure passed 70% to 30%. That's pretty much agreement. Speaking in love uh, means refusing to call each other names. We live in a country where everybody's ready to pounce. You say one word a little wrong and you're called a bigot. Calling people by name stops all discourse. Just because a person wants to enforce our immigration laws doesn't mean they're a racist. Just because a person wants to provide universal health care or raise the minimum wage doesn't mean they're a socialist. 
Just because a person believes in Jesus' definition of marriage between a man and a woman doesn't mean they're a hater. Name-calling cuts off all debate. Three, pray for our nation and its leaders. Apostle Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. God calls us to pray for our nation's leaders. Why? So that we might live peaceful and quiet lives. Uh, God instituted government so that we might have peace and order in society. You say, who needs government? I just want to be free to worship God and go to church. My children don't need government. They just need salvation. Well, in one sense, you're right. Government is just for this lifetime. And salvation is for eternity. But if you say feeding my children doesn't matter, only salvation does, try not feeding your children for a while. See how that goes. Government is necessary. If there are criminals on our road and our streets are in total chaos, you won't be able to get to church. We need government to keep peace and order. But you say, I don't like our government. I don't like who's in charge. Who doesn't bash Trump today? Nope. Not in my church. I didn't let people bash President Obama, and I don't let people bash President Trump. We prayed for President Obama, and now we pray for President Trump. We pray for our national leaders, and we pray for our local leaders. This is for our own good. When King Solomon dedicated the temple, he prayed. Why don't you read this with me? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Although this uh, prayer was for the people of Israel, I think the principle still holds. If we become God-fearing people, humble ourselves, confess our sins, turn from our wicked ways, seek God and pray, I believe it'll increase the likelihood of God healing our land. When the people of Judah were taken into captivity in Babylon, they hated Babylon. They longed to go back to Jerusalem. But God told them to pray for Babylon. Why? Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Praying for their Babylon's uh, prosperity was to their advantage. So... We should pray for our leaders. We should pray for our government to fulfill its God-given purpose. God has established government worldwide. The Apostle Paul writes, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. What's the purpose of government? Government is to provide for justice and provide peace and order. When we say, I'm not going to submit to my government, I don't like who's running it, you have to remember when Paul wrote this, the Roman government was killing Christians. God tells us about the basis for government's duty to provide judgment in Genesis 9. I will demand an accounting from every human being. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. The, human, uh, the, the punishment for a crime is not merely about retribution or paying somebody back. It's not just about deterring future crimes or rehabilitating the offender. Rather, punishment most fundamentally is about affirming the life and worth and value of the victim. Taking the life of the killer demonstrates that the life of the person who has been killed is that valuable. After all, it was a life made in the image of God. Suppose I lose your diamond ring and I say, goodness, I am so sorry. Here's a stick of gum. My guess is you would not feel justly compensated. 
You only would feel justly compensated if I gave you something of equal value to your ring. Justice must acknowledge the value of your ring. Government is given to, uh, by God to provide justice, to protect victims, and the downtrodden. We pray for our leaders to provide justice and keep peace and order. Fourth, Jesus says, be wise as serpents, Matthew 10, 16. Uh, this fourth comment is a observation of one way we all need to be wise. Recognize that the public square is not neutral. Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's Jesus. The psalmist says all nations rise up against God. Our natural human bent is to rise up against God. So when people say we can't talk about God or Christ in the public square, the assumption is that the public square is neutral. Nothing could be further from the truth. Recently, a U.S. senator on the Senate Judiciary Committee expressed her concern about a Roman Catholic law professor who'd been nominated for a, a circuit court judgeship. She said to the professor, I think your dogma lives loudly within you, and that's of concern. I'd love to ask that senator to name one big issue that doesn't depend on every side's dogmas. People say, you can't impose your morality through law. I respond, name one law that doesn't impose somebody's morality. We can't help but bring our gods into the public square. We learn in school that the founding fathers sought to separate government and religion. But what happens when people fool themselves into believing that it's possible to separate our politics from our religion? For starters, you create the illusion of a public square that's religiously neutral. But what you really have is a public square rigged against organized religion. Organized religions are kept out, unnamed idols are let in. Imagine an airport security metal detector that doesn't screen for metal but for religion. The machine beeps anytime someone walks through it with a supernatural big G God hiding inside one of their convictions. But it fails to pick up the self-manufactured little g-gods. Into this public square, the secularist, the atheist, the materialist, the Darwinist, the consumerist, can all enter carrying their little gods like whittled wooden figures in their pockets. Not so for the Christians or Jews or Muslims should they enter and make a claim of, uh, on behalf of their big G God, the siren will sound like a fire truck. What this means is the public square is inevitably slanted toward the secularist. Public conversation is ideologically rigged. Separ separation of church and state works splendidly between Christians and churches of different denominations. Don't make me pay taxes to support your Baptist church and I'll give you the freedom to ba in baptize your infants. Yet the conversation changes significantly when you apply it to the Christian and non-Christian. When the non-Christian affirms his belief in the separation of church and state, he means separation of government from my church, not his own. He says, you can't impose your beliefs and morals on me because they come from your church. Okay, but does that mean he cannot impose his idolatrous and non-Christian views on me? Ah, there's the catch. He has no official church and no God with a name. There's no such thing as the separation of idolatry and state. Too bad for me. Lucky for him. So separation of church and state only applies to the Christian or religious person. Don't be fooled. Atheism is a religion. Secularism is a theology. It's the belief that there is no God and Christianity is false. It's the belief that I am my own God. I decide what's right for me. The God of this new secular faith is self-will. So if you take God out of the public square, the square is not neutral. 
the God of the public square is atheism and self-will, the opposite of what our founders intended. Finally, distinguish between straight line issues and jagged line issues. This may be the most important point uh, for keeping Christians from fighting and keeping churches united, but I only have a minute. A straight line issue is something God expressly uh, addresses in his word, like murder. Murder is always wrong. A jagged line issue are ones that God has not specifically addressed. And uh, these are usually more complicated and nuanced. Uh, so much political dialogue among Christians these days thoughtlessly and divisively treats everything as a straight line issue. How often do Christians talk as if their position on health care or tax policy or immigration or foreign policy is the only acceptable Christian position and anyone who disagrees with them is wrong? Wow. When God hasn't expressly addressed an issue, leave room for Christian freedom. The Apostle Paul writes, value others above yourselves. We're to value other people's opinions and not make God pronouncements on jagged line issues. Is there hope for the divided states of America? <clears throat> yes, if we turn to God for wisdom, and allow him to transform our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we've been able to look at some verses in the Bible that tell us what you think about government and how we can get along with each other, particularly with those with whom we disagree. Our country is very divided. We pray for our nation. And we pray that you'd help us to do our part in lowering the temperature, at least in our sphere of relationships. Father, thank you that you care about all our relationships and you care about our nation. Help us to do our part. In Jesus' name, amen.